This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome, everyone, to the Philip Freund Prize for Creative Writing Alumni Reading, sponsored by the Creative Writing Program in the Cornell University Department of English. Um, this would be a great time to silence or turn off your devices. I got a really funny note with Lynn about people reading or looking at um, cat videos during readings. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, I would like to thank the Freund Endowment for the opportunity to bring our alumni back to campus to read for you. Um, books by these authors are available for purchase outside the auditorium, and there will be a reception in the lounge, um, Goldwyn Smith Hall 258, after the reading, where a book signing will take place. This is a really, really fun thing to do, but I have very, very, very short time, so I'm just going to tell you a very little bit about um, Lauren Allain. And the story that I always like to tell is, Lauren Allain was my very first graduate student when I got this job. I met her in the hallway one day. She came excitedly running up to me and said, you're my chair. And I said, how is that possible? I have, any, I have to fill out all this paperwork to be accepted to the graduate field and all of that. And she said, oh no, I filled out that paperwork for you. <laughs> so that was a, my intro to Lauren. Writing about um, Lauren's first book, Difficult Fruit, Carolyn Forche says, in anaphoric, in, in anaphoric bursts of inc incantatory disclosure, in huzzles of love and survival, eros and the infinite, Lauren Allain does indeed go back past all griefs and illuminations to the song beneath the song. There is uncommon spiritual knowledge here, as well as political discernment. There is much to learn while accompanying Alain on her raft of language through a troubled world and an imagined heaven to the place from which comes all singing. I have gone with her and would do so again and again. And I wanted to take the opportunity to announce that Lauren, um, uh, her second book of poetry, um, it's just been announced that the New Issues Press Green Rose Prize. Uh, Lauren is the winner of that prize, and that will her second book of poetry will be coming out from New Issue. Please welcome Lauren Allen. Thank you so much uh, for having me here and for this prize. Um, I should say, first of all, I'm way not that enthusiastic about paperwork anymore. That, that was a brief and shining moment in my relationship to bureaucracy. Um, I, I want to thank the creative writing department and uh, the Freund Endowment. And you know, it's always sort of nerve wracking to come home uh, and to be back here, but it's been wonderful to walk the halls and see the, the different things, but also to just get back to the place where um, Again and again, uh, the people here, my colleagues, reminded me that I was in fact a poet, even when I wasn't quite sure. Uh, Ken McLean and Lyra and um, Alice, all my workshop leaders here, and of course my cohort, whom I love dearly, and I'm still in touch with. Um, I'm going to open with a poem called "Grief Etches Its Silver Into Our Days," singing. What do the living owe the dead? What tribute, what memory, what kingdom, what time, what flesh, what fiction, what will, what mourning, what missiles, what flag, what dust, what patriotism, what purging, what tears, what wick and wax and wavering light, what vigils, what sirens, what capital, what codes, what questions, what mercy, what protest, what burning, what God, what terror, what blood, what wrath, 
what drafts, what suicide, what occupation, what pipelines, what desert, what hate, what brotherhood, what target, what bomb, what dignity, what sacrifices to their lingering ghosts, what stakes to scorch the guilty, what guilt, what pleading, what prisoners, what speeches, what revolution, what marches, what jury, what freedom, what is left for us to give them, what constitution, what tower do you wait in, O nation of martyrs, what anthem to salute you, what convoy, what genocide, what soldier, what search, what hidden silver, what hostage, what amber alert, what bare feet, what debt, what deliverance, what promises to be kept and which to be broken, what purpose, what redemption, what history, what ritual, what bridges, what answer, what love, what love, what living do we owe our dead? Um, so that was my 9-11 poem written 10 years after 9-11. I'm a little bit slow. Um, but sort of once I figured out I didn't have an answer, I could just ask all the questions. Um, this poem sort of answers that a little bit. Uh, again, as what can the poet do? The hoodie stands witness for Trayvon Martin. I was built for bodies like his, between boy and man, sauntering in angles he couldn't hold, but swung his limbs from, careful, cool in every step. I can tell you the story of him, unexceptional. He put change and candy into my pockets, the necessary jangle of keys and cell phone hushed in the sock of me. I watched him from the soft pile he made of me on the floor of his messy adolescent room where I lay beside his sneakers and backpack. He did his homework with chat windows open. White headphones hooked him into some steady beat. That day, he was thinking of nothing in particular. He was quiet in his skin, tucked into the shade of me. He was an easy embrace until an old ancestral fear lay its white shadow across us like an omen. I can tell you his many hairs raised in warning beneath me. His armpits funked me up with terror. His saunter slipped into a child's unsteady totter under the weight of a history staggering behind him mad with its own power. He clung to me then, wholly unmanned, a baby clutching his blankie. He pulled me close and I stroked his head, caressed the naps he had brushed to waves that morning. I felt him brace his bones beneath me, his heart a thousand beating drums. The bullet ripped through us like a bolt of metal lightning. His blood losing its purpose ran into me and I wished we were truly a single body that I could have held its rush and flow like a second sweaty skin. I can tell you how his spirit slipped out like steam from cooling water, slowly fading by degrees until he stilled. Um, I felt like I had to read this poem here while I was here, and you guys have the wonderful prison program, which I just was not capable of participating in. Um, but we did, a uh, few of us in our cohort, go to the juvenile detention center at Lansing, taught with the, some with the men and I, the boys, and I taught with the girls. Um, and this poem comes out of that experience. Dear Autumn, this poem too late remembers you. You're the new girl, body turned away from the circle, foot scuffing the floor, you don't want to belong. And who can blame you? They're a ragged bunch, the girls at the center, sullen, spaced out, or screaming in corners until the uniforms come to shake the sound out or muffle it with the rattle of pills. But for an hour each week, I come with my handouts and books. We huddle over huzzles, sonnets, haiku, then tensed over your pencils, you're supposed to find your own words. I'm here, you write, because they want me to tell them what he did. But I'm not reading this yet. 
I'm just watching how your face seems so young and so weary, your eyes between flicker and fade as you scribble into the notebook you won't be allowed to keep. I think poetry can save you, but you're not interested in poems. Your reality demands answers. It's true, he touched me. I don't want him to go to jail. He is a good person. He just needs help. Miss Lauren, you write, what should I do? Your careful penmanship loops and curves across the page, its literal plea defying the break of stanzas, meter, or line. Home at my desk, I discard note after futile note. Dear Autumn, you are brave and beautiful. Dear Autumn, no one deserves. The world is unjust, dear Autumn. Have faith, dear Autumn. This poem, dear Autumn, I never get it right. Um, and we talked earlier about teaching, and one of the things that working in uh, that workshop and with those girls kind of allowed me to do was think about some of my own experiences and and try to write from there. This poem, um, oh, so the book has all of these letters to myself. It's a great story. I, went to, I was going to Yaddo, and I was packing, and my first communion album fell on my head, and so that meant something, so I put it in a suitcase, and then when I was there, I was unpacking, I was like, ah, here I am again, um, at the age of seven, and so I, I wrote a letter to one of the photographs, so I was trying to figure out what my face was doing, um, and that started a whole series of poems, me writing to myself at different ages, um, and my running joke is, you talk to yourself, you get committed, you write to yourself, you get published. <laughs> so, um, this poem is 18. Here is the night snarled with stars. Here is the smile full of teeth. Here is the bloom of desire, its scent swift entering everything. Here are the arms, the legs, the heady nectar of lips. Here is nipple erupting against the thicketed chest. Here is earlobe and thigh, the sharp seduction of nails. Here is naked. Here, light by an exploring moon. Here is heat making a new planet of your heart, riding your blood like victory. Here is the old road you have longed and longed to travel. It hisses your name. Its breath is smoke and salt. It stings your throat like a scream. Here is the trembling gate. And yet you want to turn back. No, run back to before, which is still now or could be, if you turn in time, and you do. But here are the knots fists make of fingers, the silence one tongue can shackle to another, the willful iron of belly and bone. Here is no and no and no answer. Here shove and bite splinter like so much kindling. Here is his laughter sparking mad. Jackal, wildebeest, wolf. Here is fire and fire and fire. Skins of flame, walls of flame. There is no turning here, 18. Here you learn how to burn. I have lost count of my 12 minutes, so I will read two more poems. Um, this is... Uh, I, an Ars Poetica also that emerged from an arm wrestling situation. The X-ray. I feared and revered it, this black and white portrait pinned calmly against the harsh fluorescent glow, the cryptic stare of my doctor in her white lab coat, her ballpoint pen briskly outlining the skeleton of my wrist, the fragmented carpals, the rivers of dark separating the tiny pieces of the metacarpals, the four long fingers, their bony white columns, the nebulous lumps of each knuckle, speed bumps on a curving road, the comparative stub of the thumb, the thick layers of adipose transformed into a barely visible grayness. It did not apologize, demur, or cower at our scrutiny. It dared us even to look deeper, to pick each tiny layer apart, dig through the thick cartilage, the grain of ligaments, the ivory-colored coating to lay bare the marrow, the blue veins, the dark arteries and thin capillaries rich with plasma and blood cells on their journeys to and from the heart. I have longed to live like this, to be held up to the light, 
naked beneath any official stair found whole. Um, and this is a poem to my 15-year-old self. Uh, and thank you again for having me. 15, oh, first line requires suspension of disbelief. I am no longer 29. 15, I am writing from 29 to tell you we live. I remember our dreams, the long white halls with no end, and how when we tried to imagine life after high school, it was blank and solid as a grave. We thought that meant there was no future for us and practiced accepting our absence from our own lives, no more best friendships, school dances, no more yearning for boys to whom we were already invisible. Now we are almost twice your age. The face we couldn't envisage is yours, but leaner with shadows of mom in its profile. In two years, we will step on our first plane and fall in love with flight. We will move like wind across the world. We conjugate French class verbs in Paris and Nice. We follow Jesus to Bethlehem and Galilee. We have lived in places you do not yet know exist, like Ithaca. I see now it will all, sorry, couldn't help it. I see now that it will all begin with you, the path away from home marked with nothing. Who could walk it but the girl who has already made peace with her own end? 15, looking back, I understand our quiet death wait, the surprise of our persistent daily waking. We never could have imagined this. Thank you. I've been having technical difficulties and glasses difficulties, and so I apologize. Um, uh, Tacey at City, Diné, is sleeping rock, is sleep rock people um, and born for tangle people from Cove, Arizona. She is the recipient of the Truman Capote Creative Writing Fellowship, the Corson Browning Poetry Prize, the Morning Star Creative Writing Award, and the Philip Freud Prize. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the, actually what Alice Fulton writes about Tacy's um, first collection, Rain, Rain Scald. Tacy at City adds, a profound and necessary dimension to eco-poetics and eco-theology in these beautifully wrought poems of place, memory, and Navajo culture. Rain Scald is rich with textures and details that make a beloved community come to life, palpable and present. Surprising inventions of syntax and subjectivity serve a poetics at once visionary and imbued with the grit of existence. Tempered by hardship, seasoned with experience, this brilliant book witnesses a world at City knows intimately, and in doing so, offers courageous testimony to suffering and spiritual resilience. I can think of no poet writing today whose work is more gorgeous or moving, or no one who brings more heart or brains to the page. Please welcome Tacey at City. Uh, thank you. Yad Eshe, Sani, El Enedesha Jene, Zenaha Bethlin, Nishlan, Tkhatna, Sani, Bashishin, Tkhaban Hira Shichiro, Hashk Anha, Zawadashinale, Akot Ao, Dene, Stan, Nishlan. Thank you guys. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I just introduced myself in Navajo, um, how I was taught to introduce myself. I am Sleep Rock People. Born for the Tangle people, my maternal grandfather is Water Edge people, and my paternal grandfather is Yucca Fruit, Strung Out and Aligned people. And this is how I am a Navajo woman. It's how um, we place ourselves, and it tells you my ancestry, it tells you a little bit about the characteristics of who I am and where I come from. So um, I wanted to start with a poem called Round Our Wrists. It's actually not in Rain Scald, just for those of you who know Rain Scald really well. Um, and it's a, an homage to the Haudenosaunee people here 
in this region, um, the indigenous people here, the Cayuga, round our wrists for first man. We swing like shawls about the shoulders of brides, spread open in a field of snow. Though it's just yet fall, leaves bob red, foretell the absence of voice at eventide. Once we sat in the current of a longhouse, lulled in memory of a stew that warmed an ice monster. I raked the story for your elbow and warmth, a message so petty, answer. I missed you when you left to carve a snow snake tunnel. Upon throwing my tendon caught in the eddy of creation, I could no longer lift logs to stack. This was love in the saying, I could only follow your collar in snow so far. Bark, I braided round our wrists, round back. One of these days you will find me under the hills, under the white, where autumn floats, rounding out the soles of our feet, where the arcs of our breaths hold. So um, Rain Scald, um, as, as mentioned in um, Alice's wonderful um, review, uh, talks a lot about land and how important land is to, um, to me as a Navajo person. And when I came from the deserts of uh, Santa Fe and New Mexico and Arizona, and I came here to just, you know, lush green, and, and I got really claustrophobic uh, because I couldn't see the land. All I saw were trees. And so I would hike and hike and hike, and I would try to just see the land, and I couldn't see the sunrises, and I couldn't see the sunsets. And, and so that was really hard for me, so I found solace in the gorges. Um, the gorges served for me um, kind of that openness um, and exposure um, that, that just kind of calmed me down and, and was like, okay, we're okay. And so... Um, a lot of what rain scald is, is it juxtaposes the gorges here in Ithaca um, and also the canyons back home in New Mexico and Arizona where I come from. So these poems um, in rain scald, found in rain scald, talk about the stories that lie within the land. So here's one from back home in the mountains. Veil her stallion. When shoes no longer lace the pond line, we stamp leaves to cover or push summer where rain scarcely pools to wrap children. Homemade ice cream melted on my tongue the other night as I choked on the menthol. Stay away from there, the brown hat girl, she drowned in there, my uncle told me, a stallion too. Weeds wound with wave and current, they wrapped her ankles in a deep tunnel of, just kept her berserk in the hole where she was found, bobbing, caught up, clouds drifting from her eyes, stallion, all black, shine. He must have shone like water as wind veiled him, mane and all. I imagine the whole like mint ice cream or milkweed when it beads out at the throat. In the mountains, I gathered mint to boil for jars of jelly. I gifted one to each family member. Is this from, they would ask. And upon twisting off the lid, they'd close it tight. The sharpness cracked their lips as they recalled her mane gone trepid in the tug then snap of vines. Salt Lick. I left myself a heifer to her salt block to carve hip bone. Coke soul deposits tinged dry in the nape's shelf, a jar of salt. I lost myself in granules, prone now to live life with a chiseled tongue worn rare to the tip. 
It feels like that, like everything needs salt. Even lipoma tastes better adorned at the mouth of a gorge in thick chrysalis bling. I folded myself calmly, hands in V, rush and ready to dive, just a sleek dip into beef stock for a moment, a pastoral hush. This is me mooing, death comes heavy, pock marks, squirm, ring worm, ribeye, see the pooling, grease, what's left of me, ribbon of fat, how it spools. So I actually remember this, this poem um, when I, <clears throat> I was standing down in this gorge down at the bottom, I think it's called Fall Creek, and, um, and it was raining and it was beautiful and the poem just came to me, so rain scald. When standing in rain for so long, you no longer hear or feel it falling. You believe it's stopped. Step away, look to your skin, muck itch. It's a shame your hands have gone bald from fungus, taking you to what's beneath scab, to one of those nights when you know your gums will bleed, to say it's been a while or that it has to do with wrist mange is to say rot comes so easily now, skin weep, laps, step through the whole black of your home and still know damp, know exactly when to bend your finger for the light switch. So familiar in a bod, shame, your hands have gone haywire, taking you to what's beneath Ranges they've grazed a time when you're combed through, when you know your knuckles and all that rain has swallowed. Night song to the gorge dwellers. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this. So, um, I was, I was very fortunate to be a part of the American Indian community here and to, um, to dance with the Onondaga and the Oneida nations um, in their longhouses and to hear their stories about the places here that we're living currently and, and up north. Um, and it's, it's really beautiful, um, the stories that are held within the land. And, um, you know, when we had... Uh, a lot of deaths. We had three deaths in our community here at Cornell when I was here my first semester, and it was, it really um, touched me. Um, I was like, oh my goodness, all these students passing away, and and um, and it really made its way into this book, Rain Scald. Um, and so the, the second section of the book is called Gorge Dwellers for those who've passed on, and. Um, and at the time, the head of um, Aguego, her name was Gaguiliosta, um, she invited me to come out to the gorges and she said, we're gonna pray and we're going to sing and we're going to offer food to these spirits because um, for their people, uh, the Cayuga, Haudenosaunee, Akwesasne, in this area, they believe that if there's a jarring death, that the spirit is kind of jolted and that it stays where it's at instead of going to where it needs to go. and it people, sorry, those spirits call for people because they're lonely, because they're hungry. And, um, and so she said, we're going to go out to the gorges and we're going to offer these so that those spirits know that they don't need to call people to keep, you know, going where they're going. So, um, so this is, this is a, a little bit about that night song to the gorge dwellers. With no fire, you offer nothing. Say, a body found, Fall Creek Gorge, eventual. It is meaning to happen, meaning to say, dear fellow, 
It is with deep name, 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 strung like hair, water strands made old, made white, too close to dark, second tragedy, fall creek throat, repeated, repeated loss, thirst in almanac of the gorges, litany of wrists, look down at your wrists, down here where the thick laps the lips, where you haven't been taught to pull yourself out of the plunge pool and look for fire, look for rings shifted to your thumb and forefinger there like vapor wrapping you in strips. In this falling moment, cities sink into the depths, drown the earth, face carried up and away in the current of a whirlwind where water and mountains hide in deep blue. What faces bring a reservoir filled following the night when day fell into day, soon followed by night into night to night. Thrice with no moon, thrice with no flame, kept in the thick, thick. Okay, so um, in our creation stories, it's kind of nice because it's creation story time. Um, for Navajos, we can tell our creation stories mm -hmm. and talk about them. Um, we have monsters in our creation stories, and they were going around and they were killing all the people. And so there were two hero twins, Tobajishchene, uh, Child Born for Water, and Nayetnizgane, a monster slayer. And they went around and they were killing these monsters um, who were eating and killing our people. And um, they left 12 monsters alive so that we as a people would be humble. Um, so hunger is one of those monsters. And uh, yeah, I won't say the, some others, but they're, they're kind of fun, some of them. Um, but I have monsters kind of, you know, laced throughout Rain Scald. And so this is one of my monster poems. Monster who kicks people down the cliff. He tells me his mother once rode a mare to death, how when he was a child, she used to kick him in the pants and he'd go plummeting to the canyon floor, talking to his relatives along the way. But tonight the sky emits a loneliness that only a monster could know, and so he told me how he came to be this way. In a veil of cottonwoods, he starts, there was a river where my mother would sit, and it was there she bent her back for stones that looked like half of me. Soon thereafter, I settled like a rock inside her belly as she rode bareback along the river. Maybe it was the weight of me, but soon she regretted how she waited for the sun to warm cliffs, regretted my father seeing her longing. I've seen her clamber and wail when she went off to be with canyon walls. Later, she'd rock me to sleep. Oh, And as she went riding over, I can't tell you how the sky shot me to pieces, how my insides lay like a wet mane over river rocks. I never saw the horse again, and now my mother's people know nothing but to skid me across water into the walls below. Your people, he finishes and stands up. When you pile the night as long as I have and wait for walls to sink, then rise into sun, you can never know morning like this. Thank you. What beautiful, beautiful readings. Now, I have to start this way, so please excuse me. Jean, uh, Janine Carpenter-Cresset was only six years old when Stephen D. 
Gutierrez graduated from our very young MFA program at Cornell University, where he said he pursued, quote, a disastrous graduate career. But I met a graduate student named Jacqueline Doyle there and avoided total failure, unquote. Whether it was, a dis whether it was disastrous was questionable, as he did manage to complete his graduate degree in 1987 with the mentoring of Lamar Heron and James McConkie. Gutierrez describes himself as, quote, an old school Chicano from LA, basically with a writing habit, unquote. <laughs> with the publication of The Mexican Man and His Backyard Stories and Essays, Gutierrez has completed his trilogy, which he has dubbed My Three Volume Box Set a collection of audio, autobiographical, audio, about, biography, autobiography pieces, short stories, and essays. The trilogy includes two other books, Elements, which won the Neon Award, and Live from Fresno y Los, which won the American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation. Complete, completing the trilogy was a huge accomplishment for Gutierrez, who is currently professor at, uh, of writing at Cal State uh, East Bay. He is also a father, a husband, a community activist, a playwright whose one act play, Game, uh, game Day, won the Maxim Marzuba New Play Competition. I know I said that wrong. He is, of course, a writer of fiction, memoir, and essays, which have appeared in publications like New California Writing, Catamarang Literary Reading literary reader, and the Alaska Quarterly Review. He was able to keep afloat his impressive three-book uh, project by, and I love this quote. He says, quote, by repeating this kind of encouragement to myself, I, too, belong in the library being filled by my generation of American writers. I got to keep plugging away and working because there aren't enough Gutierrez's in the stacks. I got to leave something behind that says, I lived, unquote. Gutierrez is an astute observer of everyday occurrences, of recognitions long ago past, but not forgotten. He is a rare writer who is gifted with bravery and perseverance and who makes something as small as a gesture meaningful and urgent in his work. Certainly, Gutierrez will live on. All I can say, Stephen, is that it's been way too long. Welcome back. Let me just have a swig of water here. OK. Thank you for having me here at Cornell. Elena, where'd you go? I'm indebted to you in the English department for this honor, which means a lot to me, more than you know. I'd also like to thank a few members of the creative writing faculty from my days. If A.R. Ammons were here, I'd point him out, along with the late Phyllis Janowitz, for being accessible and committed to the subtle fostering of a raw MFA student. I drank coffee with them and with Ken McLean at the Green Dragon Cafe on a regular basis for a semester or two. And it was instructive and fun, brainy and silly, being around smart people without airs. Lamar Heron was always positive, big-hearted, perceptive, and good-humored. And I wouldn't be here at all if it weren't for Jim McConkie taking the time to explain to me again and again, very lucidly and thoroughly and persuasively, why he had turned away from fiction to the kind of personal autobiographical writing he is famous for. He did not call himself famous or anything immodest. I'm, I'm stating the obvious. Consequently, I write nonfiction as well as fiction. In fact, I'm going to read the last half of a newish essay that appeared in Fourth Genre Magazine, Abridged, the title piece of a completed manuscript of essays and hybrid pieces, Hopper at the Train Yard. I trust it makes sense without any explanation. I'll be a bit rep repetitive here. Finally, the best thing about Cornell was meeting a fellow graduate student in a summer party and asking her to dance, and I don't know how to dance. Jacqueline Doyle, a PhD candidate who still cheers me on and is here in the audience, my wife. It's great to be back. Hopper at the train yard. It's coming up. All right. 
my mouth gets dry. All right. Edward Hopper. Funny thing, he is dispensable in this essay, but essential too, crucial. He is a spirit breathing fire into it, but he would be the first to say, sure, I'm out of here at my request to leave. He would swallow his pride as easily as gulping down a burger at a greasy spoon in Milwaukee and get up and walk out, standing in the margin for kicks because he's a joker like me and likes to see what is going to happen next. He's got a paintbrush in hand or sticking out of the back pocket of his bespattered pants and is tired but eager to discover a new town, a new place to sit and stare out the window, the workday behind him, showered, dressed, and restored for another night of Edward Hopper staring out the window. Los Angeles, the mighty industrial girth seldom filmed or written about, but as big a part of Los Angeles as palm trees and swimming pools, movie stars and the industry that employs them, aerospace and Disneyland and curly waves. Grease-stained LA, overlooked, ignored, shunned by many, many visitors from around the world, strolling in Venice Beach and texting on Rodale Drive, not even knowing the damn place exists. Hey, this city is so great, it's not really a city, but that LA, my LA, the grimy manufacturing hub of the West Coast, busy keeping America powerful in those factories so big and isolated on vast tracts of weeds and dirt, or tightly packed on gray lots with the smokestacks sending up those irritating pollutants and black torrents that make our sky so infamous and our sunset so fabulous, darling. It's all worth it. Lathe and drill press LA, mid-sized concern housed in worn buildings scattered below the hills that sport a sign the world knows as LA itself, Hollywood. Dirty, dis disreputable LA, secretly responsible for much of its wealth, its incredible wealth and diversity, biodiversity. Rats crawled under pallets stacked high and fenced in corners, chasing bugs and whatever hideous antenna wiggling creatures pass for rat food and are part of the circle of life. I am a nature writer after all. I stall for time and time is my only subject and remembrance, what a life gives to make and return a gift to the world something to hope by, if only for the effort put in. I am scared. I remember those summer nights going to pick up my father after the swing ship. I remember sensing him there, whoever painted that picture, Nighthawks, and seeing my father standing at the gate with a lunch pail one night, hailing us when he saw us pull into the parking lot. We stopped and idled in the vastness of the train yard. My father took a painful step forward with an uplifted hand. Here, here, Junior, I'm over here. Or, aquí estoy, came out of him in Spanish. A Mexican-American man, my father, and me, a more clearly Americanized Mexican-American boy, his younger son. Stephen David Gutierrez, I need to introduce myself properly. I am falling apart with the world on August 13th, 2014, three days before my 55th birthday. I am walking the neighborhood at midnight singing the national anthem, waving a tiny American flag, believing in it. I'm amending free Palestine stickers with give Israel a break too in black marker. I'm shouting on the phone, yes, I'll give, how much? At charities that call endlessly because if you give once, you're on the sucker list forever. For this reason alone, I'm ready to disconnect our landline. I'm on my knees at church devoutly, a weekday attendee. I'm sitting in the back of church giggling, a Sunday disgrace. I'm drinking as uncommunicatively as ever with Edward Hopper at a low-key bar for gentlemen. We play cards for low stakes. We keep a low profile. It is all about lowness, this world, this business of survival. My brother circled the car around to get him. Here, Dad, get in the car. He opened the door for him, leaning over with one hand on the wheel, one foot on the brake, headlights searching the dark parking lot and finding nothing ahead, stillness, blackness. I got in the back as my father got in the front. It was so routine, so normally good, so utterly innocent an act, but not. Frozen in time, that moment sticks with me with terrible insistence. 
It lives on with urgency born of despair and the need to understand the world. In the parking lot of the Santa Fe Railroad train yard, unframed but vibrant, palpable, surrounded by night, an incredible tableau emerges that might be called Dad and His Boys, or more aptly, because more formally, more Mexican in truth, respect and devotion, his own absolute proven with a splendid tiredness on his face and calls forth dual emotions, pride in such a father and the anxiety due to the shitstorm about to hit. Perhaps it can be glimpsed distantly in the blue black sky. Terrible, terrible clouds gather to rain worse than shit. That's wipeable after all. What readies is pain. I rinse my mind free of the living image, the full memory, the complete picture, but it reassembles with startling clarity. My dad poised at the open car door with anguish on his face, and my brother open mouth and astonished at his bearing, his grief. And even I play my part, half out of the car, jaunty almost, yet with concern on my own face, turning around to look at them both. But clearly my father stars in the dark clip, lifting up a hand again as if to cry, here, here, I'm here, once more. And over my shoulder, the man in the diner is getting up and walking out and passing us on the sidewalk with a brief nod our way, regarding us kindly but hurriedly. Ah, shit, I might have said to myself. There he goes. Then as swiftly the picture blackens, the what intrudes is no less serious. Real time, real life pressing on but with an aggravated rhythm, without the luxury or discomfort of slow motion. Oh, shit, Dad, I said. I helped them in, I swore under my breath. Fuck, that was weird. But then the worst came. On the near corner near the barbed wire top fence, the diner shut down, one light after another going out that night for the first time ever. And my dad sat in the car now, huffing terribly and looking out the window scared. And I froze in the back seat, wanting to go home and not hear anything, anything at all but my dad started explaining anyway to nobody really, or to both of us and anybody in the world who would listen, and to even the clouds and the stars and everything around us that might understand how he got lost and confused at work and couldn't last the shift, so he was just standing out there waiting for us to come all night. He couldn't even call home. He didn't remember the number. I don't remember nothing, he lifted his hands up. Okay, dad, it's okay, my brother patted his knee. Incidents like this had been happening. It was one of the reasons my brother kept the car. But it's scary, I'm scared. He began fiddling with the buttons on his overalls, looking down. My brother checked over his shoulder for a car that might be coming and got out into the street again. He accelerated. We passed the next train yard, bustling with activity under huge torrents of light flooding the grounds, and more came at us from the side high atop long, thin poles that dominated the view at first glance. Metallic loudspeakers overlooked the yards like eyes. And underneath the metal gaze, countless men on ladders climbed up on the boxcars with toolkits swinging from their hands, ascending and descending like ants, overworked ants. And like the great lord of creation itself, reinvented for the new situation, a booming, disembodied voice coming from the loudspeakers gave its eerie instructions for the night, all part of a science fiction dream I felt at home in. Dad, what? I love you, I said, but it didn't go that way. I didn't have the right words for him. I never did. I only have this lousy piece to offer him, dead, and the fucking world going on can go to hell. But I don't mean that. I don't mean anything but that fright and insecurity are a part of me now as ever. Dad, what? Don't cry. Not even that came out of me. Nothing came out of me. I just did the best I could. I made myself comfortable in the back of the car with a hand on my father's shoulder and the Mexican station on at least, playing soothing stuff. I calmed myself and memorized for eternity the sight presenting itself outside the window so fully now I felt assured of its power to protect me. It was so aw complete and awful in its original sense, like a teacher explained to me once, meaning something good mixed in with a bad, something to take your breath away. There it stood or lived or breathed or even hung on the wall of the night, 
a living canvas with no need for my small breathing self or limited eyes to make it real. There before me, everything I wanted to see passed, down to the moon hanging over the trains that sat lined up on the tracks in orderly rows and the tall water towers anchoring the ends of the yard like mighty creatures meant to destroy any trespassers on this land. So absolutely right, I got a little choked up about it all. I couldn't help myself. I had always loved this part of LA where my father worked, but never more fiercely. He hardly noticed it now, locked into himself in the passenger seat. I saw his head. I grazed his head with a I grazed his hair with a finger. Dad, come home. <coughs> Excuse me. I need a drink of water. He hardly noticed it all. Now, locked into himself in the passenger seat, I saw his head. I grazed his hair with a finger. Dad, come home. We're going home, I whispered. I turned away and encountered the worst of the Santa Fe Railroad train yard, the desolate patch called Siberia by the men who crawled under trains in the summer heat and hunched on top of them in the winter cold, breathing hard, exhaling small clouds, and laughing, my father used to say, laughing to keep warm inside. There in Siberia, he said, the no man's land they send us to when they want to show us who's boss. To Siberia, we say, we shake hands with our compañeros because we're going to Siberia, damn it. Siberia, la yarda fea, the Mexicans also dubbed it, the ugly yard. Weed bill, the white men said. Motherfucking bullshit, the black men summed it up. I had heard them myself picking up my father in another season. Ain't this a bitch? But nobody died in Siberia. Nobody got whipped like they probably did in the real one. Everybody survived. So it was beautiful, it was grand. I saw it for maybe the last time I knew. I saw the lumps of trains sticking out in the black night and the barbed wire fence enclosing it and the single light high up on a pole shedding a luminescent yellow in a fated circle. I pictured the men dancing on the boxcars now as they sometimes did. For the hell of it, my father said, we gotta dance, we gotta do something in Siberia. I let a tear slip out because of the scene outside, but only because I was so happy. I think this is what heaven looks like, I said. I didn't say it loud. It must be like this, perfect in every detail. Only one thing bothered me. Only one thing ruined the ride home. It was that man at the counter in the diner with the long window, green awning and white lettering, called Night Shift. It comes to me now. He was sitting there with a cup of coffee in hand, hatchet-faced and still. He turned to me with a fixed expression before he got up and left, hollow-eyed and blankly staring at me as if I belonged there with him. I couldn't shake it. Thank you very much. Okay, the, the Philip Freund Prize for Creative Writing, it's an award intended to honor our graduates upon publication after their graduation. The Freund Prize enables us to award a $5,000 stipend to the, to the published uh, graduates and uh, to invite them back so that we can listen and be proud and get excited. <laughs> uh, at this time, can you please come up? Janine, Stephen. Tacey, Lauren. Yeah, yeah. So let's all dance. Let's all dance, okay? Tacey, here we go. Oh, thank you. And uh, the check is in the mail. <laughs> Stephen. Janine. All right. How about a good laugh? Woo! This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.